For everyone with an interest in MASH or more broadly steatotic liver disease, surf's up. Season 5, episode 15 of Surfing the MASH Tsunami, our look at what happened in Barcelona at the SLD Think Tank 2024 starts now. This week on Surfing the MASH Tsunami. In my flipboard, I discussed metabolic health and preventive hepatology. In the end, we had a whole flip chart filled with ideas and things to do. And I actually wrote my cardiologist an, an email and he replied within 15 minutes. In my flipboard, I discussed metabolic health and preventive hepatology. In the end, we had a whole flip chart filled with ideas and things to do. And I actually wrote my cardiologist an, an email and he replied within 15 minutes. We have to do something now. And we have to take that leap of faith. Obesity is not stopping. Diets aren't changing. People are forced different products onto the market so to have something that comes out that says well let's take the ball by the horns literally let's go and do something and then we'll get the evidence from it that's another tip. The think tank you know departed from a, a narrow focus on feasibility to think about what's needed to, to turn the tide on massively and mass in the short near and long term to end it as a public health threat by 2030 globally. We need a tailored approach to care. So it seemed like as more and more people shared information around the world about patients in particular, that there wasn't really like one solution for every, you know, that would apply to all patients. It's also an acknowledgement of the road between research finding and then to implementation is always so much longer than we envision. We spent the first couple of years on this podcast wondering what we had to do to get a drug. And now that we've got one question because what do you have to do to get it used properly and what do you need to do to minimize the number of cases in which you actually need to use it, which are two completely different sets of questions. A global community of steatotic liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most critical challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with Masseld and MASH. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Yarn Shattenberg, liver health advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guests, hepatology researchers and key opinion leaders Jeff Lazarus and Maya Thiele, and Fatty Liver Alliance founder Mike Patel, as they discuss highlights from the SLD Think Tank 2024, this week on Surfing the MASH Tsunami. Remember to stay tuned after this episode for this week's question of the week. So it's the middle of May everywhere. I'm not sure what that means for the weather in different parts of the world. Around here, the sunspots have left us with, 40, with, with days that for you who live by Celsius, eight and nine degree highs for days, which never happens this time of year. And I've been trying to wake up and catch the aurora borealis. Did catch some of it once. Spectacular. I don't know what experiences the rest of you have had. And we are here to begin a really exciting episode, I believe. We have with us uh, the two co-chairs of the Barcelona Conference. Uh, Jorn is uh, back from traveling all over the place. Hey, Jorn, how are you doing this afternoon, this evening? Hey, Roger. I'm um, great. Thank you. As a matter of fact, settling back in, happy to be home. Uh, happy to have you home. And, and Jeff, you've been traveling. Uh, well, you're always traveling, aren't you? Jeff Lazarus is with us as well. How are you today? Fine, thanks. I was just with Jorn. Jorn left me in Turkey in Saturday. I had a canceled flight on Sunday and landed two hours ago, Jaren. But Jeff, you look fresh as a daisy, so I wouldn't worry about it. You're doing fantastic. And then um, we have Mike Patel with us. He's in Toronto, right? In Toronto today, Mike? I'm in Toronto today. <laughs> yes. Mike is in Toronto today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having He's me. He's taking off on a three-country tour immediately after the two-country three-location <laughs> tour immediately after this, culminating in uh, being in Milan for Easel. And uh, Louise is in Perth, where it's two in the morning. Louise, you look fantastic for two in the morning. You look fantastic, period. You look doubly fantastic for two in the morning. How are you? I try. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's nice to see everybody. And then we have a first-time guest, which doesn't happen that often anymore. So it's a reason to celebrate. Maya Thiel is with us. So Maya, how are you doing this evening? I guess you're, you're in Denmark? Yeah, I'm in Denmark, yes. Yeah. So how are you doing this evening? I'm doing good, thanks. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm grateful for the invitation. I'm looking forward to do a podcast on a liver and non-invasive testing and early detection, treatment, etc. That's that's great. Well, Maya, I'm confident you're going to do brilliantly because that sound check that we didn't have to do for you has been about the best first time sound of com anyone coming on this thing in a year. And as, as we all heard, much better than sound check we had to do for Jorn, but he sounds pretty good. So Maya, d do me a favor, please. Do all of us a favor. Take a, take a couple of minutes and tell our audience a little bit about you what you do, 
and the path that you took to get here, academically, philosophically? And then when you're done, I'm going to have one more question for you. Sure. I'm a professor of uh, hepatology at the University Hospital in, in Odense in, in the region of southern Denmark, which is on the beautiful island of Funen. So basically right in the middle of Denmark. I myself live on the east of Denmark in Copenhagen, so I commute uh, between uh, Copenhagen and Odense and have been doing so for 11 years now. And it all started when I was a young doctor working in a gastroenterology and hepatology department and I really enjoyed ultrasonography, I enjoyed doing liver biopsies, I enjoyed managing and caring for uh, cirrhosis patients and patients with alcohol-related liver disease especially. And so I, I met this uh, guy, Alexander Krau, who is uh, now the Secretary General of ESL and was appointed a professor back in 2013 in Odense and he asked if I wanted to join and uh, we've sort of had a, a professional working marriage ever since. So from there, it, it, everything really started. I think of my entire career, I've been very keen on working with early detection, really driven by a frustration on, you know, seeing liver disease patients mostly at a very late stage in their disease and the frustration of not being able to provide, you know, care that could really turn the sinking boat around. So in Denmark, we have 80% alcohol-related liver disease and these patients, they just progress so rapidly and it's very devastating to watch. So my very first research project as a PhD student was on diagnostic biomarkers in alcohol-related liver disease using fiber scan, transcendental lithography, the ELF test. And then it kind of evolved into a more broad screening approach, looking at all all forms of steatotic liver disease and early detection in the community and primary care. So today I'm part of several European consortia working on exactly that, screening for liver fibrosis, early detection and, and biomarkers. And I've been so fortunate working with the very best people in the field and I continue to do so. It's a, it's a super collaborative field and I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. That's great. I was delighted that we got to meet earlier this year at the Liver Forum, and I'm thrilled to have you with us today. We ask people when they come on for the first time to share with our audience one thing that they might not know about you or expect about you if you didn't tell them. So um, what would you like to share with us? Sure, I think it's, it's probably very appropriate for almost four years, I had a second career as a radio host. So I was, uh, for every month, I was doing a one hour in, in national Danish radio on everything sort of health related. So, uh, so I have been kind of the voice of uh, health Denmark. <laughs> so you know what? Maya, we ask this of everyone who comes on the podcast. I'm going to guess that we've had well over 100, maybe getting on towards 200 different guests at this point in time, and that's the first time that's ever come up. So, well, happy to be. <laughs> so you are unique, at, le at least in this cast of characters. You are unique, and we've had recording musicians, we've had clowns, we've had all kinds of people, but we've never had a radio host. Actually, in, that's in many aspects, aspects, very unique. And not, and not to say the least, uh, she's about to uh, start the biggest randomized control trial in hepatology through Liver Aim, which is an ambitious project, and she leads that work package. So I think we're very happy to have you here tonight, Maya. Thank you so much. Yeah. Want to take a minute and talk about Liver Aim before we get started? You are now that you brought it up a little bit about that project, please. Sure, sure, happy to. So luckily, I will not do it alone. Rather, it's a it's a very very collaborative project. Uh, Jan is there and Jeff is there as well. It's an EU funded uh, project from the Innovative Health Initiative, uh, which is a program that brings together companies and academic researchers. So we will be kind of many, many, many uh, liver-centered uh, academic researchers from across Europe uh, working together with uh, pharma companies and biotech companies on developing and validating biomarkers both for screening and for prognosis, secondary care uh, detection in, I believe, the largest cohorts in liver disease. The first work package is is led by Lisa Pose from Barcelona. So the University of Barcelona and Hospital Clinic in Barcelona are coordinating this, uh, headed by Pechines. And in, in this work package, more than 30,000 
different uh, subjects will, from the primary care uh, and general population will have biobank samples and will measure, I believe, 15 different biomarkers. Uh, and in the second work package, which uh, Jörn is uh, leading, the core of that work package is the Litmus cohort. And there will be a follow-up and again, uh, biomarkers, repeated investigations. And then for an approach where we will go out and reach new participants, we will also do, as Jörn mentioned, a, a randomized control trial, randomizing 100,000 Europeans to liver fibrosis screening or standard of care. And the aim is really here twofold. The first thing is to investigate whether screening for liver fibrosis actually causes a, a higher detection rate of compensated cirrhosis and advanced fibrosis. But the second part of this study, which I believe is the, the very interesting part, is that we will follow up after 10 years to investigate whether screening for liver fibrosis improves outcome for those screened. So looking for a reduction in liver-related mortality and, an, and a reduction in liver-related hospitalizations. And I think this is really key to show that screening has an effect. And the important aspect here is that we do not only screen for liver fibrosis, we screen and offer treatment. I think this is the only way to do. Again, a, a good example is you would never do a colorectal cancer screening, do an endoscopy, detect a polyp and, and not remove it. So screening always need to be linked to treatment. And this is what we will do and investigate the effect of in the randomized trial. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff going on, which I believe Jess may actually <laughs> better talk about than I will. <laughs> well, I'll just add to that because, of course, it's unbelievable to do an RCT in such a big RCT. Um, the work package I'm leading for Myas Global is around the public health issues, the operational readiness. We know what tests to use now. We even know which populations to test and we don't do it. So why not? What are regulatory issues with the introduction of tests and biomarkers? What kind of readiness is there in terms of digital health? So we'll take a Spanish survey of all liver specialists and extend that across Europe. What kind of digital health interventions, apps and so on, everything from electronic medical records to much more advanced support are they using? What would they like to use? What kind of uh, education awareness needs are there in the field? And then we're going to do a series of 24 webinars, firstly to raise awareness and then to actually contribute to the recruitment of the trial. So there'll be webinars every quarter until 2030. So it's hard to believe the year we should be achieving the sustainable development goals. We'll still be doing webinars, <laughs> at least contractually we will be. So every time I say something like this, Jorn says, don't say this, but I will. I probably won't be doing the podcast by the time the study is done, but somebody will be. Maya, maybe you with radio background. And I'd love to hear more about this and our audience would love to hear more about this as you go along. And in addition to the webinars, Jeff, although if you want to send the webinars, maybe we'll do excerpts of those as well. Well, make them Jeff Lazarus's greatest hits or something like that. It would be, I think it would be uh, compelling. With that, why don't we get started? Uh, just one simple groundbreaker, one good thing personal professional has happened in the last week. Brave one, go first. Well, I'll just start because as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I finally made it out of Turkey after a, a canceled flight in a storm. And I think it's like summer where Maya is in Denmark. And I know it's beautiful in Spain, but it was pretty cold, windy and rainy in Turkey. I didn't bring a jacket. I didn't look at the weather. So I really just had my suit for the meeting and shorts and flip flops for the rest of the time, which didn't work out too well. But I had a canceled flight, a missed flight and got home just uh, two hours ago. Well, we're happy you could make it and we're happy you're warm. Okay, next. I'll Go. Super excited about uh, June 13th. We're part of Global Fatty Liver Day and we have a, an event with 100 people from the community in Calgary, Alberta. So we have 100 people we're bringing in and we're going to teach them about metabolic steatotic liver disease. And we're going to actually have a fiber scan there as well. So we're going to do as many assessments as we can. So And so the good news about it is that we actually have almost 20% already confirmed to uh, to come and it's still a month away. So it's uh, again. You sound more confident on getting to 100 now than you did when we talked about this a little a little bit two weeks ago. That's great. Yeah. Well, well it's always the first few that you want to get started. But Excellent news. Now, I'll, I'll jump in next. For those who don't know, I um, ruptured most of my ligaments in my right knee nine weeks ago tomorrow, but um, I can look to start playing golf again in four to eight weeks. So 
I am really happy at that news from my consultants. So um, that made my week. <laughs> I'm guessing the uh, figure skating and ice dance careers are over, but that's really great that you can. Yes, but at least I can start playing golf. And um, we've got another 10 months probably until I can even start to even think about getting on a ski slope again. Okay. You're in my, I guess you're the two we haven't heard from yet before me. I'll just make it quick. Uh, it's been a busy week. Started off with the SLD think tank and finished off in Turkey with a pathology meeting. Jeff mentioned because it was a great pleasure to meet colleagues and also see Jeff there again, but uh, busy traveling. So my highlight is being back home, having the kids around and seeing patients. So uh, back to normal. All good, Maya. Yeah, so if I have to say one good thing, it must be cutting the grass for the first time, which really is a marker of spring coming. So that's kind of a a moment of... I'm jealous. I've been cutting grass for like these eight weeks now. (laughs) (laughs) It's been cold in Denmark. So (laughs) it's only now. Uh, I figure. (laughs) You're one of my favorite places my honeymoon started in Copenhagen. So uh, love Copenhagen, love Denmark. I guess my good news is I'm going to go back to something we talk about a lot on this podcast, but haven't recently, which is uh, my football team finally won a match on Saturday, which means that they're going to be playing in Europe next year, probably in the Europa League, which will be a nice thing because we had played for several years before, seven years, I think it was literally before this year, we didn't qualify. People thought that we were going to be worse, uh, our best player left, and we've had a very successful season. So that's a good thing, a small thing, but a good thing. With that, why don't we uh, kick into our discussion? To you are to Jeff. This was a really unusual meeting design, very, very different than what people expect. So I'd love the two of you, in whichever order you wish, to tell us a little bit about exactly what that design was and how you came to develop it. Sure. I'll start. Thanks, Roger. So, you know, I launched the innovations in what was then called NAFLD already in 2019, and it was probably too early. A lot of great speakers came, KOLs from across Europe, but not many participants. COVID came, we put it on hold. And then three years ago, I invited Jaren to co-chair with me. And the last two years in May, we ran the meeting Innovations in NAFLD Care, what we called Inc. BCN. You were at one of them. And it was hard to get people to attend. It was easy to get experts to come. It was in Barcelona. They had a good time presenting. We got to research meetings and work together, but it was harder to fill the room. And since earlier, um, I had been running the Wilton Park think tanks where we published the expert recommendation on models of care, the research and action priorities. We had 45 you know, experts from around the world discussing and debating the issues in a, in a closed format. We thought, why don't we go back to that and really discuss among ourselves? So there's probably not enough, but there are still a lot of opportunities to learn about MASLD and MASH in, in various meetings, both big like the ESO and, and ASLD congresses and, and smaller meetings, important meetings like, like Paris, NASH and others. So um, we decided to switch um, in the autumn to a think tank format, but still allow those who wanted to participate who weren't going to be in, in the speaker group to join. So we had a faculty of 30 people, and then we had another 70 people in the room. The idea was to cap it at 75, but there was a lot of interest, so we let it grow to 100. We had a really nice location in a club in Barcelona, and what we did was we took five hot topics and we asked the chairs to present in about 10 minutes, a sort of state of the art overview. And then we prepared questions that would really push three or four discussants who were on the stage. Then we opened it up to the rest of the faculty in the room. And then we opened it up to everyone else in the room from patient advocates and industry to just others you know, who wanted to be there. So we addressed issues like bridging the diagnostic gap. So obviously, you know, Maya was involved. Prevention is the cure, hidden in plain sight, the future of treatment now. We had a session called Making Ready Our World Unready. And this was really around things like the legal and financial readiness um, we need to be able to address MASLD and MASH. And finally, we had a, a last session that Dr. Zobar Yanasi chaired called Targeting Investments for Social and Economic Returns. Along with that, those five hot topics, we had two workshops, one led by Elliot Tapper on social media. It was really great. And he's a great person to do that, Mr. or Dr. Liver Twitter. And then we did what we called an open space session led by Chris Kopka. Maybe Maya or Jörn, you want to comment. There were definitely some doubts about how this was going to work, but we put 10 flip charts around the room and Chris set it up where we would ask people in the audience, what's an issue you want to talk about? Stand by a flip chart and then people in the room could go to that person. And when you get tired of talking about the issue, or even if you're the person who started it, you just move to another conversation. So people were moving all around the room for an hour discussing issues. We recorded it down and then we reported it back. It's a great way to be 
disruptive, to come up with new ideas, but also for everyone to interact rather than sort of a discussion sitting on the stage facing the audience. That's a great point. I think that open science session, which I was also worried about how it's going to work out, was very descriptive of this year's program that, as Jeff said, we wanted to move a little bit away from the typical frontal lectures of experts to a more interactive and really form it where we come up with new ideas. And standing at my flipboard, I discussed metabolic health and preventive hepatology. So everybody was able to say something. People left, people came. In the end, we had a whole flip chart filled with ideas and things to do. And I actually wrote my cardiologist an, an email and he replied within 15 minutes, let's do it. So I felt like we discussed it, a lot of input and something even came out of it. So I didn't know that type of technology or that approach to um, foster interaction. Uh, but Chris was great at uh, putting that forward and, and it really uh, made things different. Sounds different. I did something once like that 20 years ago, roughly like that, except with only four, four flip charts and 25 people, which made it a lot less unwieldy than this might have been. But that, that just sounds exceptional. Uh, so Maya, Mike, you guys went through that experience. You want to talk a little bit about uh, your impressions of the event in general and that in particular? I think I could start with that particular event. I, I thought that the open space was really a very good experience. I thought it really released some uh, great discussions and creativity and a kind of a ping pong of ideas. And I think this was especially fruitful because there were many different people in the room. So it was not all academic hepatologists. It, people were coming from uh, very different backgrounds. So the input, at least for me, was also very diverse, which is always good when you want to generate ideas. Um, Mike? Yeah, Maya's point about the diversity of commentary is spot on. I remember uh, really well at the beginning, it was like everybody's looking at each other for the first minute or two. So how do we get started? And then it didn't take very long until uh, people just kept going and going until we filled the whole page with comments and suggestions and feedback. So the whole meeting was interactive. That in particular, uh, there was a lot of opportunity for everybody in the room to have a chance to actually contribute, which is great, right? Everybody always had a chance to contribute, but not everybody did before, but they did during the session. And I didn't move because I was so deep into the discussions in the place where I was. We were looking at groups that are normally difficult to reach, could be immigrants, could be people belonging to lower socioeconomic status, it could be minorities. And so some of them may not go to their GP. When they go to their GP, they may present differently than that what the GP is used to. They may not adhere to screening programs. And this was yeah, a very interesting discussion. And uh, from Jeff's group, we learned a lot about the outreach for detecting HCV in immigrants in Barcelona, how to approach uh, this. And I think one point that I took with me that was kind of part of this open space setup is you know, that the, the idea is to end up having some sort of product. So kind of something going forward to not just not just questions, not just uh, this needs to be researched further, but rather what can we do right now? So our group came up with the idea of making a kind of a, a cookbook or a list of available actions that have already been tried towards a reaching minorities and, and other uh, groups that are hard to reach from other fields and then try to apply that in uh, hepatology and in liver fibrosis testing. So for me, that was kind of a very uh, specific thing that was ready to work with that came out of just a little less than an hour of discussions. Wow. Badly needed, though. Great topic. Topic I think we all we all need to think more about and, and a broader topic than frequently we do. That's fantastic. I was just listening there thinking how innovative that is, because I think we've discussed before multiple times, we could do a lot of research and research can take an awful long time, but we have to do something now and we have to take that leap of faith. Obesity is not stopping. Diets aren't changing. People are forcing different products onto the market. So to have something that comes out that says, well, let's take the bull by the horns, literally, let's go and do something and then we'll get the evidence from it. That's innovative. It's nice to hear that that was the sort of type of discussion that was going on in the room because that fills my boat every time because we do have to do something now. We've researched for years. So it sounds great and exciting. I'm looking forward to hearing some of that next year. Well, thanks, Louise. You know, it was very different from when you were there. I think two years ago, it was really needed. We, you know, a lot of people needed to get access to speaking to the experts, which can be difficult at the large conferences, and also to discuss some of the issues that aren't always brought up at the conferences, including public health and policy issues, in addition to the treatment and models of care. But at this meeting, we tried to really think big. So the think tank, you know, departed 
from a, a narrow focus on feasibility to think about what's needed to, to turn the tide on Massilee and MASH in the short, near, and long term to end it as a public health threat by 2030 globally. So um, I wanted to move away from detailed discussions on cutoffs and say, well, if we could wave a magic wand, what would be the NITs that you would use now? Let's imagine they could be everywhere affordable and accessible. Or what new NITs would you snap your finger and, and they would be available or we would work to make them available or develop them in the next three to five years? So we did have a, you know, the think tank was preceded by an NIT summit where we really dug into NITs. That was half a day with a, a lot of lectures and discussion. But the think tank was just like, we are where we are now, but how are we actually going to change things in one year, three years, and five years? So before I ask the answers, let me ask a process question. Jeff, you are in all of you. Was there one particular direction this went in or one particular way it worked that surprised you or delighted you more than you expected it to? For me, I was impressed that everyone was there the entire time. People really weren't on their phones. I was up front and I'd look around and say everyone was engaged because it was interactive. So the whole meeting was interactive. Every session of 80, 90 minutes just had 10 minutes of presentations. So we flipped it around. So it wasn't instead of death by PowerPoint, it was ask your questions or get ready because you're going to be able to answer the questions from the chairs, even if you're sitting in the back corner you know, of the room. You're right. Maya, Mike, anything that surprised you or particularly delighted you about it? I mentioned at the event the point that we need a tailored approach to care. So it seemed like as more and more people shared information around the world about patients in particular, that there wasn't really like one solution for every, you know, that would apply to all patients. So it depends on their background and where they live and the challenges they have and all of that stuff. And so we had a little bit of discussion about that as well. So let's go back to the agenda and the individual sessions before we get to open space. And Jeff, Bjorn, if you guys could walk us through one at a time, what was in that particular session, what the 10 minutes before that, that preceded uh, life in the absence of PowerPoint were, and then a little bit about what you took out of that topic. And uh, then I was Maya and Mike to share their impressions of that session. We'll ask some questions. We'll keep going. So dive in. Sure. I'm happy to start, Yaron, unless you'd like to. Go ahead. So I should also say um, you'll be able to read all about this. We're writing it up as a sort of viewpoint call to action or position paper. So the faculty will share the main themes and the main discussions without attribution. So we had Chatham House rules like we did at Wilton Park, but everyone knows what came out of those meetings, the large consensus around action and research priorities, the expert recommendation on models of care. Here, um, you know, I could start with sort of the end and say to achieve that vision of ending MassLD and MASH as a public health threat. We came up with really 10 main issues. The faculty haven't all seen them yet because it's only been a week since the meeting, but I'll just mention a few of them and Maya, Michael, and, and Yaron can comment. But it came up over and over, the need for consensus on guidelines for the use of NITs seems pretty obvious, but we're in a really exciting time when in the U.S. resmitteron can be prescribed without a liver biopsy, yet we don't agree on which NITs and even which cutoffs to use as a field. That's very different than other therapeutic areas. Pushing for automation along the entire continuum of care, automatic fib fours, uh, maybe reflex testing to ELF. Wherever we can, we need to automate. If we're going to test hundreds of thousands, millions and tens of millions of people, we need to get as automatic as possible. And we have great experiences from other disease areas. Again, developing multidisciplinary models of care. Who's going to lead the teams? Um, is it the endocrinologist? Is it the hepatologist? Is it the GP? What will influence who actually heads a sort of model of care depending on the fibrosis stage and so on? Like last year, we had a focus on fostering preventive hepatology. So just like there's preventive cardiology, which is quite well developed, the field is now starting to talk more and more about preventive hepatology. It was already coined back in 2008 by Gideon Hirschfeld and others. And then we wrote about it last year in the context of social nutrition. ASLD will have some sessions at DDW on it, but this is incredibly important now. Aligning nutrition with drug rollout, just like the FDA said in their press release approving Vismitaram, we also need to have diet and exercise. So we think we need to look at how we can do a nutrition aligned drug rollout. Performing robust economic analyses for policymaker engagement. The policymakers are going to ask things like, what's the cost of inaction? How much does the medication 
transportation costs, you know, who should pay? Why should we pay? When can we stop paying? And then integrating social, commercial, and cultural determinants of health, including for risk stratification. So we often refer to MASLD as a lifestyle disease, but that really puts the blame on the individual. And individuals are facing poverty, low education, low health literacy, low literacy, vicious and challenging marketing campaigns to eat ultra processed food, processed food, and just junk food in general. So we need to look at those commercial and social determinants. And I think there's a role health well, hepatologists and liver specialists can play in understanding who their patients, clients are and the conditions they have. So it's not just go home and, and eat better. That's getting into the details. Those were some of the main themes that came up. There were plenty more that the faculty will try and um, boil down. You covered it well, Jeff. And I remember at the end of the first session, we were um, given a magic wand by our um, chairs. And actually, things that we came up with were very societal, political aspects. We, I think we agreed that we had mechanisms and biomarkers. They can be improved, um, but we have things in place to get started and screen for patients. So many of the things we want to do in prevention or awareness, getting patients to not having to pay their own tests, having healthcare systems reimbursing tests that do identify patients at high risk for end-stage liver disease. That magic wand was really swung in towards society and political decisions. So I think this was uh, important and and reminded me that uh, in the field of pathology, we've been working hard to refine tests and we've clearly made progress there. So you weren't, is that what you would have predicted the, the magic wand swung towards or was that a surprise to you? I, well, I, I think I, I was happy to see that we agreed that we had guidelines that recommend referral pathways, tests to be used. As Jeff said, we didn't uh, fight about uh, cutoffs and numbers. I think the general impression was that we are in a position to screen. We need to refine this and there is room for further development of biomarkers and referral pathways. But at the large picture, to end this, as Jeff put it, we'll need a lot more support from governments, from, from pay us taxes were uh, mentioned, uh, reimbursement. I think that was a crucial thing that came up over and over again because not everybody can test uh, because the system doesn't pay for the test. So these things, and as physicians, we can only bring this uh, to the broader table and at a broader level to be discussed. That was good. Don't you think, yeah, that it's also an acknowledgement of the road between a research finding and then to implementation is always so much longer than we envision. You know, we have a new biomarker, we have a new study showing something, we have a new drug, and then bam, we use it. But it's really such a complex web of different stakeholders at different levels in the healthcare system from the individual patient to the payers and to the whole healthcare system that just are constantly putting a break on implementation efforts. So it's super difficult. Well said, Maya. I agree. In fact, Maya, listening to you, one of the thoughts I had was that we spent the first couple of years on this podcast wondering what we had to do to get a drug. And now that we've got one in the States, at least, and are likely to have that one in other countries and are likely to have more. Now the question becomes, what do you have to to get it used properly and what do you need to do to minimize the number of cases in which you actually need to use it, which are two completely different sets of questions. It's intriguing to listen to you go there. Mike, you look thoughtful. Well, I just, I really like the part, and maybe Jeff and, and Jaren can, can talk about the results because I can't remember the output of it, but the prevention assessment treatment voting, where would you spend your time focused? And, you know, Naeem naturally focus a lot of time, if I could, shouldn't attribute too much there, but just saying that there's a, some interest to, obviously now in treatment side as well, but a lot of focus on the prevention and assessment side as well. I don't know, Jeff, you remember the breakdown a little bit, but that was interesting, the uh, the voting, the way you did that. Yeah, I don't remember the exact numbers. I have them written down, but there was a lot of focus on prevention, but also discussions around, well, there's also a lot of people who need to be treated right now. So I think that was nice. You know, in, in moving ahead, we treat, but we try and prevent. It's not like with an infectious disease where by treating you actually prevent, but hopefully as people get treated and it becomes a little more normalized and people can talk about it more, that will contribute to prevention as well. I do recall that um, someone from the audience uh, from Canada had raised the challenge of assessment with the number of fiber scans that are available here. And there was only 94 in the entire country. And so assessment is going to be a challenge. And also just patients having to pay for some of the very basic, you know, ASD, for example, tests. And so those are two huge challenges that have to be overcome. Exactly. I remember that number of 94 and thinking how vast Canada is. I don't even think there are any in France, which is interesting with Ecosense being a French company. But, you know, we really tried to say, you know, in a, in a way we have the tools, right? We have NITs that are 
pretty accurate, especially when you combine them. We have a, a mass specific treatment, but also obesity and other drugs that can be used. And yet very few people are identified. Very few people are being cared for. And that's where we tried to, to dream big. What do we need to do to double the diagnosis in two to three years? For example. But, you know, one thing that I, I think was mentioned a couple of times was also the stigma related to, to liver diseases in general and diatonic liver disease, obesity as well. And one of the added benefits of having a pharmaceutical intervention towards mast cell D is that it could actually improve uh, the stigma. It could help raise awareness, but it could also help lower the barrier for patients to, to ask their GP and be more open in their discussion about detection of, of liver disease and potential treatment. So I think that's an added benefit of actually having a drug treatment, even though we for many years have been able to treat both MAS-LD and MED-ALD and ALD by targeting their risk factors, there still remains this kind of nihilistic approach that among many healthcare workers that, oh, we can't do anything anyway, so why bother finding patients when they won't ever change their lifestyle? So I won't ever look for them. And I think this yeah, nihilistic approach can be changed, uh, even though it's an expensive drug, just the fact that there is a drug. And, and this was also mentioned. I fully agree. I think at so many levels, the availability of a pharmacological treatment is going to change how physicians practice and assess a disease. And this will get this up for sure. Screening is going to improve. I think we still have to do a lot of work and education. So Jeff, looking into the future, one of these years, we might go back to a larger educational uh, event even. But having said that, I think there are many interesting questions we have to develop. And I felt that this year's think tank was really unique for that. Um, I was just going to jump in on what you said, Mike, in the context of you commented on 94 fiber scans, for example, in Canada. Did the teams discuss actually how they're used and utilized? Because they should be doing something in the region of 40, 470,000 scans. Are they doing that sort? Or are we still talking about scans in a clinic in hepatology doing a couple of clinics a week. So being basically not utilized in the type of way that we now need to look at utilizing non-invasive techniques like Fibroscan or the other mobile devices to maximize what they should be doing to help do the scanning and the screening. Because if we're saying that each one of those 95 scan machines, like I can find in the UK, might be doing 500 scans per year, that is an underutilized resource that we are not doing in the rest way because we're pocketed into the old way of thinking that we have to deliver this from a hepatology clinic with a nurse once a week in this location or this location so we don't get the value and we don't get the reach. So did you look at how many and ways to enable that within the NITs? Yeah, I think you know the answer, Luis. I mean, there's massive underutilization. That's the irony. When I used to work in Copenhagen, we had a portable fiber scan that was used one, sometimes two days a week. And there were all kinds of issues around transportation insurance. Could you bike with it? Like my and I would bike. Um, we've also had our crashes. Um, but, um, you know, how do you transport these things? The insurance, that's maybe an extreme example, but it takes a lot of logistics to maximize the use of any healthcare tool or diagnostic tool like that. And that effort is not being made. So, you know, the irony is on the one hand, you know, there's 94 fiber scans in Canada, which isn't enough, but then even those 94 aren't all necessarily being used enough. So it's how to get that balance, how to get that happening. There's studies going on, at least in Europe, about more and more using fiber scan in the community. It took us almost one year to get IRB approval to do that as a part of a study. We have another study with fiber scans in general practitioners' offices and primary care. And again, it's slow going. There's training. They have to make the time to use it. There can be reimbursement issues, not in this case because it's a study, but otherwise. So we need more of these imaging tools. And at the same time, we need to use more of the ones we have. And maybe a way to coach the people who have the machines in the clinics on how to better utilize them. Because I also, and you're right, Louise, I can give you examples, which I won't do now, but uh, of clinics that have them and are definitely uh, not used into capacity. They have lots of opportunities, but they're a little bit further out, a little bit more remote than some of the center areas. So I think it's about encouraging people to use what they have too. You're right. One of the many things Louise has taught me over the last four plus years is that utilization here takes on two contexts. Number one is, is it getting used enough hours a week? And number two is, are we doing a good enough job of taking taking the lessons that you can learn from a scan and transmitting to them to the patient while the patient is present so that you can actually turn it not into just a, here's a 
test, but here's a test, here's a result. Let's talk about what we're going to do about it. It seems to me that those are both issues in terms of optimal utilization of machinery. And I'm wondering if it's too early to talk about the second one because we're going to have base core underutilization, or do you really think we attack both of those at once? Well, uh, for my question as you're asking those questions is who's going to do the coaching? It's not like there's, there's somebody assigned to that, right? So the clinicians sitting there with the machines that they paid for themselves in some cases and not using them to capacity as a charity. I mean, we had an event there as an example, and they worked with us on that, but that's just once. So there's a lot of other opportunities for sure for that. But I, I think the education piece is really important also. Louise does it every day, so she would be able to answer that for sure. We use a different model, and this is what I was looking at this, when you were talking about the 94 scans. So we use a different model. If you need fiber scan, we will get it to you with the practitioners, and you can have your 10,000 scans per machine or 5,000 scans per machine. It's a different model, so they, we're coached, we do it. So the reason we developed this was I've worked in that system in healthcare, whereby the machines are underutilized. We don't have enough resources. So actually create something that's skilled that just provides the resources. From listening to Jeff and Maya and that earlier, it was about where these solutions were coming from. And this whole different approach to taking out something different. If you look at the ECHO program, hepatitis C and how that developed into bespoke, difficult to treat communities and to take those skill sets. And I think that was what Maya, you were alluding to earlier, is the learning from that and being able to stand by a board and listen to other people's work within that. Jennifer Selpin, um, a nurse practitioner in the US, took out a little mobile van and started scanning in different parts in hard to reach communities, for example. These are pocket projects. And I think we can do that with NITs. We've discussed with Stephen on the podcast before, the little cassettes that you can have with blood tests for going into Africa and more hard to reach communities with different ways for liver. And, and, and that was the sense that I got from listening to Maya, Jeff and um, yourself about what the didactic part of these conversations was really giving, which was exciting to listen to what was going on earlier. Thanks, Louise. You know, now we're diving into the weeds, but you get a feel for what the think tank was like. So it was a hundred people trying to address particular problems. And a lot of it is operational, logistics, health systems, preparedness. Do we need better NITs, better sensitivity and specificity? Sure. But even with what we have, we're not getting, you know, the bang for the buck, you know, out of them. So that's why the think tank is here to stay, Yearn, right? Yes. And I think with the open space, this is where you could gather around Maya or Yearn or someone else and be two people or three people or 33 people and discuss the issue as long as you want it. I think if we do longer open space sessions, we can have really specific questions where we want to find, you know, solutions. So, you know, what in the business world would be like, you know, minimum viable products and so on, but just, you know, really dig in to answer some of this. And we don't get this opportunity at a lot of the bigger scientific conferences. So that's where the added value of this smaller, largely invitation only meeting fills a gap. You know, it's a think tank and the webinars throughout the year, we'll bring up some of these issues and we'll talk for 30, 40, 50 minutes again on a particular issue that emerged from the think tank that needs better addressing. So Michael, maybe we need to bring the Canadians and do a Canadian hour and talk about that and have Louise share her experience and the ECHO experience. That would be really cool. And so on and so forth. With whatever issues emerged, we've been thinking about it. Now we need to find solutions. That would be really great. I just want to add something that Jeff is probably going to smile in your end too. And it has to do with Maya said with diversity. But, and this was not an accident, but the percentage or the number of younger people there, because we get older and more and more people are younger, but the younger people it, it, that were there was fantastic because they were so interested and so engaged, right? So early career kind of people. Thanks. We made a concerted effort. So some people come to hear the KOLs, to hear the experts who have 10, 20, 30 or more years of experience. So they were there. We had 29 faculty. We allowed 10 posters to come and the presenters were there presenting their research. We allowed a couple of people to invite very young investigators and interested parties to join. So we had a teenager, we had a 22 year old in there and they were great telling us, you know, what they were doing in a high school to raise awareness. And it was really invigorating for all of us across the age continuum without going into detail. Okay, so Jeff, congratulations, by the way, on your 20,000 day celebration recently. We know exactly where you sit on that curve, plus minus a few days. But Someone said, how did you know? And I said, I've been counting, but obviously there's an online calculator. But ever since I saw the 
the Nick Cave 20,000 Days documentary where he documented that his 20,000th day on Earth. I was like, I got to remember to celebrate that day because my birthday's in the summer, right? So the office is closed, you know, and school was closed. I had to have my day. But then I mentioned it at the Turkish Hepatology and Manal said, well, today's my birthday. So, of course, you got the cake, but that's all right. I got a piece. I'll get a cake for you, Jeff, next time. Jeff, you, you couldn't have blown out 20,000 candles anyway. Go ahead. Jordan. Yeah, 20,000 candles. That's a good one. The one thing, you know, we've been discussing a little bit of uh, system approaches and public health approaches. The one thing that we did combine with the think tank this year, again, was an NIT summit, which preceded the event. And while we said we have tests that do perform well, I think there is still a lot of room for training. And uh, Jeff, correct me, but this is something we really want to carry forward to in uh, one of the other format, in getting more hands-on experience experience on different NITs to be used. Louise could come along talking about her best practice experience and applying FibroScan and not having it sit in an office where nobody uh, uses it. So really that type of instrumental schooling or teaching people that are in the field that are going to apply those tests and maybe the modification of these tests, new technologies here too. Uh, that's something we want to carry forward alongside uh, those discussions. Yeah. In fact, as a part of liver aim, we have to train people in non-invasive tests. So we were talking with the coordinator about having a squad merge so in future the NIT summit can work closely with liver aim there's already an overlap in the lead investigators and we can do some of that training there I also think that whereas the think tank discussants were all you know experts in the field but not from industry the NIT summit can allow industry to also present some of their work and we can debate discuss um, we had hands-on with the hepatoscope with escopics and with the fiber scan from Ecosens, but I think we can do more hands-on even have some challenging cases, how to interpret them, maybe some quizzes for the group about how they would interpret different values, what they would do next, what, what's, what's available in their setting. One topic we haven't touched on was Elias, Elia Tabas' excellent kind of state-of-the-art talk, which was really the only kind of true or classical talk during the think tank. He is, for those of you who don't know him, is an editor-in-chief of Hepatology Communications, uh, Hepatology's kind of little system stuff journal and is also the king of liver Twitter, I would say, with, um, I believe, more than 20 or 30,000 followers, it's probably still counting. And so even though I've heard him talk several times about social media and how to use social media to, one, disseminate research, to engage patients and other stakeholders beyond academia, he's really always very inspiring. And my take home messages this time was his input on video as a new format, especially for younger investigators and younger doctors and healthcare workers to obtain and to keep track of knowledge. And I think this is something that could potentially also be worked into to new programs that, that we, we learn in different ways. And a new generation, they go to YouTube when they want to learn a specific topic. And I myself, honestly, whenever I have a Gordian knot of some statistical problem, I go to YouTube as well. There's, there's a bunch of very good information there. And I think as a liver community, we can also also harvest some of the strength in visual dissemination much better than we do today. I don't think I'd ever be able to put together a piece of equipment without YouTube, even on much more basic things than what you're talking about here. It makes a tremendous amount of sense. We're rolling towards the bottom of the hour. And my first thought I have to tell you about three minutes after Jeff started talking was James Joyce famously said about the first page of the novel Finnegan's Wake, it uh, took him 18 years to write it. It should take you a lifetime to read it. And I'm thinking you had two people, 100 people for two days, that's 200 days. It might might take you 20,000 days to process everything that came out of it if you, if you ran it all the way down to the ground. And Jeff, that would be a goal for your 40,000th day on Earth. So I've got two questions for each of you. One is, one message that came out of the meeting that we haven't touched on yet that you think this audience should hear. And the second thing is one thing you'd like to see next year that you didn't see this year. Brave one, go first. Well, I think something based on the think tank format that we didn't have so intensively this year is uh, the other involved partners. Um, Michael was there, so we had patient representation, but I'd like to open this 
close up to a broader patient representation. The nurse representation wasn't great. And some of the allied health professionals uh, or some of the solutions we came up with were aimed towards allied health professionals, nurses, registered nurses, physician assistants. So coming back to the initial concept that we developed, I still do like the idea to address a broad audience and engage all of them. There's the right time for everything. This time around, I felt we had a good balance, but we might have to broaden that in the future. I'd like to see someone from the World Health Organization come back. So we had a director at one of our earlier think tanks and we had an economist lined up who unfortunately wasn't able to attend. But we did have WHO, great WHO representation when we ran the World Health Assembly side event last year. Um, I'd like to see them at the think tank debating and discussing. Um, I should mention that we were planning a United Nations General Assembly side event on MASH, the first of its type. That'll be in September. We're hoping WHO will attend along with some ministers of health. So there's only so much we can do from our field. It's kind of the bottom-up approach, but we also need this top-down approach from ministries of health, norm-setting organizations and agencies like WHO, the United Nations. Okay. So first of all, if you'll allow me to find my way to New York to watch you do that, that would be an amazing event. Sounds like a fantastic event. And it's a short train ride from Philadelphia. So it's a lot easier than having to fly to Barcelona. Maya, Michael, your thoughts? I would add one group to Jern's list. The primary care, I know we had a couple primary care, but maybe we could use more since there's still the front line. And so just to get more feedback from that group, because clearly that's important. And I was also struck, just as I mentioned before, just about, I think, the need for earlier education and just continue to find ways that we can teach people who are younger about what their world is going to be like so that they can get those habits started early. I'll just leave that. Maya? Well, so so I'm a bit of a technology geek, and I would I would maybe love uh, to see how how we can harvest and be on the forefront of using new technologies in the mass D field. So proteomics and MS proteomics is rapidly approaching a clinical care. I know in Denmark there are two hospitals now who have uh, mass spectrometry proteomics machines in the hospital. Uh, analyzing patient samples. And I think this technology is so powerful uh, with uh, so much potentially, especially to uh, kind of disentangle some of the heterogeneity we see in uh, steatotic liver disease. And it's obviously not close to implementation, but it's very rapidly getting there as these techniques are getting increasingly powerful, fast and, and cheap. Uh, so that would be uh, maybe a topic for for hepatology of tomorrow. To bring to next year's meeting. Okay. Louise, you have any questions or comments as an outsider? As an outsider, I was listening earlier on when you were all talking. It was the fact that are we approaching a time when we talk about preventative hepatology being a pre-speciality? Because we know liver disease is the, towards the end process. And when you talk about early detection, when we talk about screening, screening liver health, is for me that early diagnostic, that early preventative, that early education. But that's a whole different field. It doesn't really fall to metabolic health. It doesn't really fall to cardiology, who are the also towards the end stages and involvement of poor liver health. So whether or not when you talk, Jeff, earlier about preventative hepatology and the, the coining those phases, where do we sit that to make it such a pre-screening? And I think, again, that was things that were alluded to earlier on in the descriptions of what was happening. So did, was that a feeling that came out that we need to sort of specialize earlier down with the screening? It's all right, screening for liver disease. Liver disease is towards the end process. It's not the early preventative, but there was a big thought about prevention. The preventive work will come earlier before you reach the specialist. So there was talk about having trainings for hepatologists where they might get certificates, more CME style trainings and so on. But I think this is going to be um, something in endocrinology, primary care. You might have nurses and, and other APPs and so on that could get specialized in that. I think, you know, we're seeing over the years now much more interest in, in the liver. Not, not a lot of interest, but a lot more than three or four or five years ago. So I hope people will see that value. We still have a WHO that has, you know, five NCDs on the agenda for the big high level UN meeting next year, none of which are, are, are liver disease, which is kind of amazing. But, you know, there's movement to um, to change that. And I think preventive hepatology will speak to agencies like the World Health Organization. Also, you know, we're already doing so much that is preventive hepatology and just not calling it that. 
right? I mean, anything dealing with nutrition, anything dealing with exercise and healthy living is preventive hepatology. We just need to make sure that it's being mentioned as well. It's added value for for not much added cost. So I guess my question would be, and we need to, we all collectively need to dial up the sense of urgency about this disease. Knowledge and urgency both. If you don't know about it, you can't be urgent about it. But once you know a little bit about it, urgency becomes important. And I guess my question would be, how can those of us who aren't healthcare professionals help that happen? Those of us who run podcasts or do radio shows or um, just are citizens of the world, how do we help that? How do we support what you're doing better? Besides show up in Barcelona next year. From my perspective, I think it's important we send a unified message that liver disease is costly and gruesome for patients affected being diagnosed late. We have the tools to diagnose them and just spread the word about liver health, I think that would be, uh, you know, without diving into the all details of NITs or, or, or applications, um, spreading the world about liver health, telling, you know, your family, your friends uh, to live a liver-friendly life, uh, I think that will be crucial. I think also hepatologists, we have a kind of a vested interest in the liver. So to have people who are not hepatologists, who are not trained in gastroenterology and hepatology, speak openly about the importance of keeping your liver fit and healthy, that in itself, I think, is a more powerful voice than if someone like me is trying to promote the liver. That's interesting. Go ahead, Jeff. Roger, let's get a, a cardiologist, an endocrinologist, a GP, and a hepatologist on, on the next call. Let's get um, representatives from patient groups that deal with cancer, diabetes, and obesity. And I know you've, you've addressed that a little, but that's how we can grow this community of practice. So when we have a liver-specific issue, yeah, we need hepatologists to explain treatment development, to walk us through NITs and cutoffs. But then we need to talk to the others from adjacent fields and understand why they're not doing anything about it, or if they are, what they're doing it and how they achieve that. Excellent. So two thoughts on that. Number one is unrelated to any of this on one level. I find at social events and other things I do in my life when people ask me how I spend my time, I more and more find people interested in hearing what exactly I'm doing and what a fatty liver is and how it matters than say three years ago when the easiest way for me to be the loneliest guy at the cocktail party was to say this is what my podcast is about. If it's not a medical podcast, that's not the case anymore. Second, Jeff, in terms of what you just said, I would love to work with you on how to do that. When you've got when when you got recommendations in place, you know, we have the ability on this podcast, we set it up differently to put hundreds of people in the audience. We haven't really worked on that because that's not fundamentally what we're targeting at. But I would love to review you and Louise me to start talking about how do we build one of those? Maybe make a panel that has six different specialists and then figure out how can we do that? Because uh, yeah, this is a vehicle for that. And I, and I would love to be part of that process. And now here's Roger with this week's question of the week. And here's this week's question of the week. On our episode today, Jeff Lazarus, Jorn Schottenberg, Maya Thiel, and Mike Patel discussed an array of issues and ideas that arose at the SLD Think Tank 2024 in Barcelona earlier this month. One underlying theme is that while we would benefit from having better diagnostic tests and more medicines, we can make tremendous progress against this pandemic by making better use of the tools we have today. Can you think of one way that making better use of the tools we have today can make a major dent in the mazel pandemic? And now for the Season 5, Episode 15 Business Report. Slava Ukraini, glory to Ukraine, and also Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. U.S. arms are arriving in Ukraine, which is good and necessary in the better late than never category. But at the same time, some major U.S. media is reporting that Kharkiv, a major Ukrainian city, is under pressure from the Russian forces. A third thing going on at the same time is that Putin has reshuffled the Russian military leadership, although there's no clear single theory on why he did so. Whatever, we continue to stand in witness to and testimony to the tremendous bravery of the Ukrainian people. Here at home, more ambiguity. It becomes clear that campus demonstrations were the work of outside agitators to a significant degree, but anti-Semitic episodes are still way up, still pays more attention to the 30 students who walk out of a graduation than the 7,000 who stay, and the people presenting today as most strongly anti-anti-Semitic are the same ones who do not show the same fervor when the anti-Semitic activity comes from the other end of the political spectrum. Forget whether from left or right, we all must do everything we can to support democracy and the pluralistic state in which we live. As for Israel, unclear what comes next. Negotiations appear not to be getting anywhere, and 
Too many parties are interested in continuing as things are. Let us all pray for the hostages. Chroyam Slava, glory to the heroes of Ukraine, and also Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel live. Exciting news. We are accruing new followers at an unprecedented pace. Last week, it was news that we crossed 1,000 LinkedIn followers three and a half years after opening what was then a surfing national LinkedIn page. In just the past week, we've gained another 40 followers. In fact, our follower growth rate increased 60% over the last 30 days from the 30 days before that. Within the next week or two, new followers should expect a note from me or an invitation to link in personally, after which we will ask you to come join our weekly newsletter mailing list and explain why that's a benefit. Our first newsletter last week got an excellent response. One reason it's a benefit is that the first newsletter got an excellent response. That came in two forms. Attaboys are nice job notes from some of our most fervent supporters. And two queries about possible business collaboration from companies that we respect. We're looking for feedback on what we're doing that is right or wrong. Please let us know. We are looking to collect more notes and audio clips for the Stephen Harrison Memorial page. In Monday's audio, I wrote a note from Dim Tonev responding to our post about the memorial episode for Stephen. Fantastic comment, and thank you, Dim. I intend to post that comment and others we've received through LinkedIn to the memorial page. If you would like to send a note or leave an audio for us to post on that page in memory of Stephen, please let us know. Coming next week, an Easel Congress preview. Over the next two weeks, we will preview the Easel Congress agenda at least once, maybe twice. Watch all the usual spaces for more information. On the audience front, a major market just reached number three in the medical top 250. For the first time since late 2022, Mass Tsunami has cracked the medical top five market in a significant world market, thanks to the good folks in South Korea. Oh, we also reached the top 40 in the Health and Wellness 250, much tougher standard, at the same time. Again, thanks, South Korea. This week's vault looks back to last year's Barcelona coverage. This week's vault comes from last May's INCBCN 2023 that Jeff Lazarus referenced in today's episode. That meeting also included the major section on NITs, in that case, reviewing nail NIT data on the issue. That was a different approach to NITs than this one. Listen to think about how much progress we're making on this issue and how different this year was than last. That's it for this week. I want to thank our team, Jorn, Louise, Mike, Eric, Steve, as we keep moving forward. Enjoy our upcoming conversation Saturday and Sunday. Please take a listen to our question of the week and, of course, reply. We'll be back next week to talk about the Easel Congress. Until and stay safe. Surf on. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to questions at surfingmash.com and we will answer on the podcast or website. Your question might even wind up being the question of the week. <laughs>